Hi readers. Today we're going to start by the Great Horn Spoon Chapter 6. All right, Chapter 6. It's called Spoiled Potatoes. Look at, I wonder if that's Jack climbing up, 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 up. Spoiled Potatoes. It doesn't sound very tasty. Day after day, the two gold ships beat their way north along the ragged coast of Chile. Black smoke boiled up from their funnels and headwinds spun in out into long streamers. Jack sat on a stool and praiseworthy stood over him with a pair of scissors. The boy's hair had shot up like broom straw during the long passage through the street, and Praiseworthy had no intention of letting it grow any longer. Hold still. I am holding still, said Jack, as still as I can. Praiseworthy snipped away. You'll be a, a young man before your Aunt Arabella sees you again. May she forgive me. You're getting your height like a sapling. Praiseworthy, said Jack. Do you really think we'll strike it rich? No doubt about it. The wind carried away snips of yellow hair. Maybe all the gold nuggets will be dug up before we get there. Nonsense. There'll be enough for all. But in the privacy of his thoughts, Praiseworthy didn't believe for a moment that they would be stubbing their toes on lumps of gold. Still, he must see to it that young Master Jack did indeed strike it rich. It would not do to return to Boston without a sack or two of treasure. Why, some of the passengers had brought along chests and boxes to be filled with nuggets and gold dust. As praiseworthy clipped away, passengers stood around watching and offering advice. Even a haircut broke the monotony of these endless days at sea. Needs a little more of a snip on the other side, said Dr. Buckby, who had thrown away his alarm trumpet and regained his good humor. Nah, said Mountain Jim. Work them shears along the starboard beam there, praiseworthy. That's where it wasn't even up a minute. A shout from the lookout view drew everyone's attention to the sea raven astern. She stopped making smoke, Captain. Smoke had indeed stopped billowing out from her funnel. Captain Swain came out on deck and gave a ship a squint. Her coal bunkers are empty, he said. She went round the horn. We saved fuel slipping through the strait. But we're not in much better shape ourselves, gentlemen. If this wind doesn't turn around, we'll be burning our last lump of coal soon enough. By the end of the day, the sea raven slipped entirely from view behind the horizon. Praiseworthy took no comfort from the Lady Wilma's lead. It's the end of the race that counts, he said again. I'm going to pause there just for a second to tell you that chapter seven is called the end of the race. So hold tight because we're going to find out soon what happens. The wind didn't turn around. It died away completely. The Lady Wilma was able to keep steam up in her boiler for almost a week. One day grew warmer than the next, and soon the gold seekers were peeling off coats and sweaters. Jack shucked off his shoes and took to climbing the rat lines. He tarred hemp ladders stretched up to the mast tops, wearing a stocking cap the first mate had given him. He would spend hours in the crow's nest seeing the world there were times when he felt he could almost see California. The day came when the last shoveful of coal was scraped out of the bins. The boiler fire burned out. The merry thrash and throb of the side wheel seized and the Lady Wilma sat, be calmed. 
Day after day, the gold ship languished on the sea, waiting for a good wind to fill her canvas. A week passed. Two. And then fresh water in the tanks got dangerously low, and Captain Swain ordered it rationed for drinking only. From the crow's nest, Jack looked down on the gold seekers wandering the decks like caged men. One day, praiseworthy came up the rat lines, bowler hat, umbrella and all, and they watched for whales to pass the time. Is Aunt Arabella an old maid? Jack said, an old maid? He leaned his chin on the hook of his umbrella. Your Aunt Arabella is not an old maid. She is a wonderful woman. Is it because of my sisters and me? Is what because of your sisters and you? I mean, if she didn't have to bring us up, maybe she would have got married a long time ago. The butler dismissed the thought. Stuff and nonsense. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah said it was because of us. Dear Miss Sarah is mistaken. I have no doubt that your Aunt Arabella is merely waiting for the right gentleman to come along. And I dare say he'll be delighted to gain two fine nieces and a stalwart young nephew. Constance has said Aunt Arabella was in love once, but he died and she never got over it. Dear Miss Constance is mistaken, I'm sure praiseworthy replied softly. Now, let's have no more of this talk. Look here, aren't those sharks? Sharks? Sharks they were, and Mountain Jim, who was fishing, caught one. He called for the cook, and Mr. Azaria Jones gasped. <gasps> You're not going to eat that thing, are you? I sure am, answered Mountain Jim. If he had the chance, he'd eat me, wouldn't he? I'm gonna pause there. So over the weekend, when you come back, we'll finish chapter six, and then next week, we'll see who wins the race by the Great Horn Spoon, chapter six, part one. All right, readers, have a great weekend, and I'll see you soon.